Greetings, fellow seekers of mindfulness and all forms of health and wellness, and welcome to another captivating episode of A Therapist, a Buddhist, and You. We're your hosts, co- we're your co-hosts, Zal and Luke, and today's exploration promises you to be introspective and enlightening. So we're being brought to you by the Recovery Collective in Annapolis, Maryland, a wonderful home for healing, growth, and change. Go check out their link in the show notes. And if you want some one-on-one counseling from Zal, that's also the place to go. So go ahead and check out the Recovery Collective. This episode is being released the week of January 15th. And it is a fun and fruitful week, Zal, for me and some of our local listeners here in Annapolis, Maryland, in this general area. Um, So Tuesday, which is January 16th at 7 p.m. at Club 164, in downtown in Annapolis area, I will be presenting in an award-winning "Your Voice, Your Future" town hall series. What do you think about that? That sounds exciting. Yeah, it's. I'll uh, be there. I'm glad you will be there. I appreciate that support, <laughs> and we'll be live and nationally televised to more than over 125 television stations. So um, depending on when you're listening, I should be able to put that link for the live event if you want to watch it streaming, or you might be able to check out your um, your TV station. But the topic is recovery in America, and we'll basically be focusing on measures to assist people in recovery from their addictions. So it'll be a panel. It'll be myself as the licensed therapist and certified addiction, you know, quote unquote, I use this loosely expert, but uh, appreciate it. Um, Brock Anderson, who's the founder of of Club 164, which is a Sobo recovery club, kind of one of its first of its kind. And it's, it's, um, we've done an episode with the the Brock and the club, Um, county executive Stuart Pittman, and then a recovering addict alcoholic, Chad Ritchie. Uh, We'll all be on the panel, and then at the club, there'll be like 80 to 100 people, and they'll be asking questions and and, and when it comes to the topic. And uh, the um, the, we'll also get um, questions from people streaming. So I have, it's not like I can exactly prepare for this because it's, it's a live event and it's about recovery in America, but it's certainly a topic that I'm familiar with. So if you have any interest, whether it's live or the recording, I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. So, yeah. In addition to to that, that'll be, that will be on the 16th. And once again, for those in the area, uh, Saturday, the 20th, I'm doing a therapy and recovery workshop from noon to 5 p.m. also at the club. This was set up before this this TV thing <laughs> I was working with. Um, Rock, Brock gave me a call and they're doing a lot of things for, you know, this is a, a non, non-profit sober club. And yes, they have recovery meetings, but they offer a lot of awesome services and this year, they're um, doing some resume building. They're bringing some people in that have the skill set to help people with their resume. They're having a, a lawyer that's donating his time that people might have some legal issues. And, and me as a therapist, I'm going to uh, donate my time in the sense of um, from noon to one, I'll be talking about doing a live event or a workshop on kind of the role of therapy in all forms of healing. So I'll talk about how therapy can augment your current recovery if you're not in therapy or or how therapy can augment your 12-step recovery and vice versa. Um, a lot of times people may go through uh, getting sober through 12-step recovery and they may have a stigma towards talk therapy. Um, so that will be the first hour. And then I'll do some breakout sessions individually for people, if they might feel more comfortable to talk to them for about 15, 20 minutes on their questions and therapy in general. If they may, if they want some referrals, I'd be glad to help them with referrals. And I'll be doing that from one to five. And, and, um, the, the the club wanted me to donate some therapy sessions. So I try to find out how can I, um, clinically and ethically best do that. So I'm donating a handful of sessions similar to like an EAP amount of sessions and then uh, if it's the person's appropriate, I'm not going to do a deep dive and cut them off after a handful of sessions. But um, yeah, 
So that will be on the 20th. So a lot going on next week for, for me. And if you guys are interested around the Annapolis area, come join us. Pretty interesting, huh? So let's talk about what we're doing next, huh? What are we doing? I think uh, in this episode, we have the privilege of delving into the insightful mind of our Theraveda life recovery and coach Zal. And I think today we're doing a, how I don't think we've, we've coined a term yet Zal, but you continue to write some awesome articles that people can, can check out at the recovery collective website. Um, and it's a good one that you're sharing with us today and we'll have you read it and then you're going to expand on it. And then if something jumps out at me, I know last time we did this, you just went right for it. So we'll, we'll get right into it. I've been talking too long. So you take it from here is all. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. I might not read the whole thing or I might pause after each thing. I'll just try to play it by ear, but I want to thank um, the website for me to have a platform to I've always been interested in writing uh, but it's good to have that opportunity to write things that are practical uh, for people and also reflecting on my own genuine experience so it's a really good connection so I want to express my gratitude for that so let's dive in so the title of the blog as I remember and it will appear on the screen eventually as well I believe but it is creating a sustainable recovery plan, specifically mindfulness and the power of community. So I will be reading that. And um, again, this comes from my experience, which is original, but things that I learn <laughs> is not original. Uh, I, I learn everything from people, wise people. Uh, before me, both in recovery and, and in Buddhism. So, um, yeah, so there are two parts to it. First is uh, meditation part, and then the second is recovery community part. So I'll expand more on that uh, as I'm reading it. So I'll just go ahead and start reading. Again, the title, Creating a Sustainable Recovery Plan, Mindfulness and the Power of Community. Self-awareness and solidarity. In recovery, every step is a delicate balance between personal introspection and the strength found in the support of others. This path, while deeply individual, is enriched when walked with others. This blog will explore the essence of the first foundation of mindfulness, according to Buddhism, where self-awareness becomes our guide and the warmth of a supportive community our steady companion. Together, these elements weave a sustainable path towards healing. Let's, let's discover how mindfulness and the power of collective wisdom can eliminate the road of recovery. First part is the first foundation of mindfulness, according to the Satipatthana, which is translated as the four foundations of mindfulness. It's a discourse, a Buddhist discourse that uh, specifically dive into the practice of mindfulness. And uh, the first foundation, first foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of the body, kaya, K-A-Y-A, that's the Bali term. So this is what I have written. As we navigate the recovery journey, our first and most intimate guide is our own body, the primary focus of the first foundation of mindfulness. This ancient practice, rooted in the cultivation of self-awareness, teaches us to tune into our body's language, understanding its signals and messages as we move towards healing. Mindfulness of the body begins with simple awareness. It is about noticing the breath as it flows in and out, feeling the subtle rise and fall of the abdomen or the sensation of air passing through the nostrils. This act of mindful noting can be a powerful anchor bringing us back to the present moment, especially in times of stress or craving. But it extends beyond the breath. In how we mindfully observe our actions, whether eating, walking, sitting, standing, or resting, we learn to recognize our body's responses to different emotions and thoughts. 
This awareness is crucial in recovery as it allows us to detect early signs of discomfort or unease, which are often the precursors to cravings or a relapse. This awareness practice helps ground us in the here and now, providing a stable foundation as we face the complexities of recovery. The beauty of the first foundation lies in its simplicity and accessibility. It is always available to us, a constant and gentle reminder to return to the present moment. As we cultivate this awareness, we build a stronger, more present self, better equipped to deal with the ups and downs of recovery. So I'll pause there really quick and um, share a little bit of my thoughts as I'm reading it. So what sparked me to do this uh, writing comes from the fact that um, I was talking to uh, a friend and um, my sobriety day came up and then my friend's response was like, oh, you have nine years coming up. <laughs> and uh, it, it just caught me by surprise. And it makes me think about how has my recovery been sustainable you know, for this long? And so it was like a pleasant surprise. Um, and then I think about what's been happening in my recent recovery and also what's been consistent in my recovery since from the beginning. And it goes to these two foundations, uh, meditation practice and the relying and drawing energy and the strength out of the recovery community. So that's a background story. But to expand more on the first foundation, uh, it does come from the four foundations of mindfulness. But uh, what I'd like to unpack more on uh, with this writing, with this piece is, um, so there's the four foundations of mindfulness, which is, which is Satipatthana, uh, four foundations. First is mindfulness of the body. Second is mindfulness of the feelings. Third is mindfulness of the mind. And then the fourth is mindfulness of the truth. But interestingly, there is also another uh, expensive uh, discourse, which is called Anapati, Anapanatati, uh, which translates as mindfulness of breathing. And it's really interesting and very long uh, because it expands each foundation into tetrads. So it turns out to be 16 steps because each foundation expands into four steps. So uh, I like to talk more about that. And uh, there are different theories according to the canon that some people say that only if you complete all those 16 steps, you know, the path to liberation is possible. But there are also other school of thought where you can just focus on one tetra deeply and then it can lead to liberation. So I don't subscribe to either necessarily or one over the other, but I would like to explore more into the first foundation of mindfulness from that point of view. So uh, without getting too technical, I do want to share about those four steps, which is um, very relevant for recovery, is that... Uh, the first two steps is quite simple, which has to do with observation of the breath. So when somebody, when one breathes in, if it's short, one notes that that's a short breath. And when you breathe out, if it's long, one notes that it's a long breath. And that those are the two simple instructions, but at the same time, it can be expanded into that's a deep breath, that's a shallow breath, or that's a sensation of heat at the tip of the nose when I breathe out, or that's a sensation of coolness at the tip of the nose when I breathe in. Whatever it is, it has a lot to do with being present with the body, you know. So uh, it has to do with the breathing, but it can be expanded into the body too, which has been uh, very helpful for me, especially for the past few years uh, since I started uh, adding yoga classes and practices to my recovery journey as well. So the body can be very grounding when we're present with it. But then the third and the fourth step is where it gets interesting because after we've grounded, being present, being observant, we can start using that as a, a tool. So the third step is about breathing in and you sensitize your body. So you breathe in and you become sensitive to different feelings showing up in the body, uh, which can be very helpful when dealing with cravings or dealing with stress. And as we know, you know, uh, or as people in recovery know, drinking or using, it's just a symptom. It's a solution. So it is as a result of something that has already occurred when somebody relapsed. There's also that term people use called a prelapse. You know, it, it all starts in the thinking. And uh, 
drinking or using or going back to an old behavior is the the byproduct of everything that has already happened prior to that. So mindfulness is very useful because we can take action um, before it's too late, you know. So, uh, yeah, do yeah. you want to jump in? Yeah, when, when you said that in the, that beginning paragraph, and this jumped out at me and, and you were seemed to be explaining it, this ancient practice rooted in cultivation of self-awareness, and this is my, my favorite part so far, teaches us to tune into our body's language, understanding its signals and messages as we move towards healing. So I'm thinking about that and someone in early recovery or long-term recovery, to your point, that, and I'll ask you, do you have an example, whether it's for you or some of your recovery clients, that were their examples or your example of what was your body language? What was a signal for you that your body was letting you know, whether it was stress, anxiety, or craving? Mm. What was some of that body's language that you're aware of? Hey, listeners, we've got something extraordinary to share, a chance to reshape your journey no matter where you are. You're familiar with Zal Mall's insights on our podcast, but there's more. Through the Recovery Collective, he offers life, mindfulness, recovery coaching, and meditation groups guiding you toward a fulfilled and mindful existence, no matter your location. Zal's journey from a Burmese Buddhist novice to a skilled practitioner equips him with timeless wisdom and contemporary strategies. Whether you're navigating life's shifts, seeking clarity, or pursuing self-awareness, Zal's coaching serves as a compass guiding you toward success. The best part? Zal's approach centers on your growth and empowerment. He equips you with tools to tap into your inner strengths for a continuous evolution no matter where you are. Ready to take that next step in your personal growth journey? Connect with Zal Mall and the Recovery Collective at 240-813-8135 from anywhere in the world. Investigating in your journey reaps immeasurable rewards. Let Zal Mall guide you toward resilience, clarity, and empowerment, no matter where life finds you. Now, let's transition back into our conversation. Stay tuned, stay curious, and keep your journey growing. Yeah, it is uh, different for different people, but I think there are also some generalization when it comes to fear, when it comes to anxiety, you know, or insecurity, uh, sense of safety, things like that. But uh, for craving in particular, uh, for me and my experience and people that I've worked with, uh, you know, the, the symptom can be noticed in the breathing, um, like breathing faster, you know, uh, hmm. or a little bit of discomfort in the chest. Or for some people, it's in the stomach, you know, like some kind of uh, intuitive feeling. Uh, but, but for me, usually at least into a relapse eventually anyway, but um the, the sensation in general is a little bit of like untangled, uh, some kind of a tanglement, you know, that needs to be untangled, which is also has to do with the fourth step of that first foundation, which I'll share a little bit. But it, it comes from that place of like tightness, that there is something that is being um, tightened, you know, and, um, and it needs some release, you know. So mm-hmm. it can be any kind of tension that shows up uh, in the body. I know over the years, some of my clients, it was they'd bite the inside of their cheek <laughs> mm-hmm. or um, before their anxiety level got bad, where they noticed it was high in anxiety, they might twirl their hair or just like rub their hairline. And these were signs that some of the, the body language overtly, are, and, I, and I like your examples too, because it's almost like, man, if we're identifying if we're present with our breathing, the cadence, the feelings, the, the, the entanglement, it's an awesome level of mindfulness and awareness. Mm. That's good. Yeah. And a big part of recovery too, uh, is having the ability to make choices. You know, that's also, is very related to mindfulness because we're able to expand the gap between a thought and making a decision, you know, being an alcoholic or an addict means that there's not much of a gap. I have a thought and I do it right away. You know, there's a compulsiveness, impulsiveness, uh, but being aware of the body really helps kind of slow down the process. Um, and then doing mm-hmm. something else as opposed to things 
that our brain is wired to do in addiction, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, also, to expand more on that too, I, I realized that uh, I used to just meditate, you know, just with the mind. But since I've started doing yoga, I also have this habit of uh, I do full lotus, you know, cross-legged over time, especially if it's a long practice, I self-correct by looking at the mirror in terms of like symmetry or alignment. And it's really amazing how even a minor adjustment, like a micro adjustment, can have an effect on the mind. Like some kind of misalignment and when it's corrected to be straight, like the mind gets affected by it. It's it's kind of amazing how mind and body are all so connected, you know. And uh, so, so I will... Oh yeah, I keep thinking of your uh, gosh. Each one of these expands into four more steps <laughs> for the teachings. Mm. I can see why. I can see why. <laughs> yeah. So I like to connect the last step, four step of that first foundation with the remaining part of the writing, which I can just summarize uh, without having to read it. The whole thing is that the, the four step is the again that ability to make a choice. So the first two steps is observation. And then the third step is sensitizing, like being in tune with what's actually am I feeling in these parts of the body. And then the fourth step is that I can use the breath and then calm the body or release the tension or uh, soften any kind of tightness. So uh, your body becomes like uh, a meditation object that you can work with in a way, you know. So, um, so yeah, that 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 is what it is. But also at the same time, to connect with the collective wisdom is that people who are connected with like meetings and recovery community really knows this because you know the suggestion in the recovery community, uh, especially in twelve step community, they talk about going to ninety meetings in ninety days, you know, and um, and there's power in that because when we, I guess it's different during COVID, but like when you go to a meeting or physical gathering, it's you're physically being there, you know? And um, if you start paying attention to how you're feeling in the meeting or in the group, there's something that is being communicated. It's almost like an electrical feel when you walk in, you know, either there's a warmth or there is a sense of safety and something happened physically in our or in our psyche or something's happened to our state of being and then the more you do it the more you get used to it and then i guess some kind of um transfer of energy too right when you see people who's been sober for like decades and then you start kind of getting that energy you know that vibe from them and then it creates room for safety and then the possibility of some kind of change so that's how i like to connect the fourth step of like having that ability to calm and not to choose not to drink or use with the help of the power of, you know, the collective wisdom or relying on, or at least being open to some ideas that I haven't entertained before. That's great. Thank you for that. Yeah. We only scratched the surface. (laughs) This is good. Do you have any particular questions that, seem unclear or something that jump out to you, Luke? No, I think that's a, a good um, starting off point. I guess, what would you tell the, what would you recommend to the listeners as you gave them a taste of that mindfulness of that body, that first foundation? What are you wanting them to take away or, or recommending for someone that, that just received a little tidbit from you, where can they go with this? Hmm. What should they practice in their recovery uh, practice uh, when it comes to the mindfulness of the body, the first foundation? Hmm. Yeah, great question. And uh, that gives me an opportunity to express my, you know, sincere mission or genuine mission is I do believe in the innate wisdom or intuitive wisdom or intuitive kindness that is available within each and every one of us. Uh, So that's why I also am a a big proponent of like silent meditation and stillness. So uh, one thing that I can share is about when we spend time with our body and with our mind in a very intentional and mindful and kind 
way on a consistent basis, we end up becoming a good friend to ourselves, you know, which is a good antidote for, you know, any kind of destructive or any kind of addictive behavior, which to me is a form of self-abuse. You know, there is an abuse of the, the body or misuse of the instincts and the body. So like getting in tune and becoming familiar with how our body responds to different situations or different emotions it becomes like a something that you're working with together you know and the choices healthier uh, diet or healthier lifestyle exercising they all come naturally um, as we start listening to the the body the body knows you know the body does a lot of things that are like beyond our conception you know <laughs> like digestion or uh being able to use water in a very proportional way or like minerals, like chemicals and all these things that are happening and it has its own intelligence going on. So working together with that is, is a great help. I hope that answers your question or I hope yeah. that's, I mean, yeah. That's wonderful. I, I want to give, let's say the listener that either is trying to get to a an early recovery and they are have a craving and they're doing a they're one of the coping skills in people's toolbox that we we recommend is to do a meditation is there something that you would recommend that might be a little bit uh, i know it's not often your go-to but how would you guide them and in, in when it comes to the first foundation with a meditation if they have a craving. Yeah, breathing definitely is a, a good place, but it can also be a little overwhelming for some people. So any kind of like walking meditation, you know, uh, can be good too, being present with each step. But if you are already, if you already have access to a recovery community, like that can be as simple as a meditation practice, like physically going to a meeting, and then mm -hmm. making a commitment to stay for the whole hour. Like that is meditation because you don't leave. You sit there and there are people around you, which is keeping you safe. And that one hour, whether you know it or not, is meditation. Yeah. That you just saying that re reminded me of almost countless amount of conversations I've had with, with people when I worked at treatment facilities and they come into my office and they have a very strong white knuckling type of craving. And I talk with them for whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes, maybe 30 max, but usually that 15 minute mark is, is often the sweet spot. And they come into my office and they're shaking their leg and their heads down or they're up and they're just breathing hard and, shortness of breath, but all those things and just full blown physical craving. And usually in 15 minutes for the people watching on video, they're back here. And I ask them, Hey, do you notice, do you notice how relaxed your body is? And it's almost like a whole oh, shit moment that mm. where they came in talking to me and in a 15 to 30 minute mindful conversation, I help them realize where their body is now and, and bringing that mindfulness and awareness to the cravings gone. And mm -hmm. your example of walking to a meeting, feeling your, feeling your feelings and feeling your body in a meeting can be, can be a mindfulness practice. So, so thank you for reminding me of that, that it doesn't have to be this. Yes. Breathe this way and exhale this. No, well, mindfully walk to a meeting and it's, <laughs> That's it. That's, that's, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, it can just be an incremental collection of, even if it's like 0.001% of believing that everything's going to be okay, you know, and that it adds up. Um, and then because, you know, as an addict, uh, we know that when we're in that withdrawal place, it's like we're going to die if we don't do that. We're going to die if we don't use it, you know. But then as we sit with it, we realize that, oh, actually, you know, I, I made it, you know, so that becomes like a good muscle memory for next time, you know, and over the years, yeah. you know, that's like a muscle that is being practiced, which can be done. That's awesome. Thank you, Zal. Thanks for shedding more light on that to us. And for the listeners out there, 
he may have read only 30 or 50 percent of his of his article so if you'd like to read the full thing um i'll leave a link in the show notes as well so as we conclude our exploration with Zal today remember that the transformative power of mindfulness and, and the strength found in a sustainable recovery plan carry these insights into your recovery cultivating self-awareness and fostering connections. A special thanks to Zal for sharing his wisdom. And if you found ins this inspirational, please like, comment, and or subscribe. I can't say that enough, so please do so. Thank you. The path to healing is ongoing, and your journey is uniquely yours. Stay tuned for more enriching conversations on mindfulness and recovery. Be mindful, be present, and continue your journey toward a balanced and fulfilling life. My name is Luke. This is Zal. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. See ya. Thank you.